Hello, everybody. Hello. Um, my name is Adam Franti. Uh, I'm going to be doing this lecture about bringing a sword to a gunfight. Um, if you have any questions as we go through, feel free to raise your hand. I might just skip past you. I might address your question just then. But if you have questions, you know, just raise your hand. Um, so this lecture, uh, we're going to start. It's going to be a bit weird. Um, we're going to go through some history, and then we're going to talk about mostly the culture of fencing in two periods that we call the long 18th and the long 19th century. Uh, the long 18th century starts in 1688, it ends in 1815, and the long 19th century starts in about 1780 or so, and it goes until 19, uh, 1918. So it's not technically the 18th and 19th centuries, it's a little bit bigger than that, but you'll see why we kind of want to talk about these sort of eras as our bookends before we get into it. Um, just to kind of start about this, this guy is at the BIA, it's a painting called the Master, or Master Fencer, Fencing Master. Uh, and that's been my phone background for years as this sort of a aspirational thing. I always thought he looks like nobody's gonna fuck with that guy, right? Like he looks completely confident, right? He looks he's just looking at the guy like ready for anything, right? And this this kind of like composure and this sort of this sense that you get from this guy of absolute mastery is what fencing was about, even into the 18th and 19th century, right? So <clears throat> A lot of people, uh, a few years ago, uh, I was unfortunate enough to start studying Meyer, and in 2015, 2014 or so, the, the thing about Meyer was that he was a sport fencer who didn't matter, he didn't kill anybody ever, he was not part of the military, so it, none of it made any, you know, uh, lethal sword stuff is for Fiore and Lichenau, where Meyer is just a sport guy, right? And they're talking about somebody who was teaching fencing in the 1560s. And partially, the person we have to blame is Meyer himself, because Meyer had one single sentence where he says, guns are around now, and people have forgotten how to fence. But the thing is, if you go look at 227A, the guy who wrote that also says, people forgot how to fence. And if you talk to Fiore, he says, people forgot how to fence, so I'm preserving the art of fencing, because people have forgotten how to fence, right? So the gun had nothing to do with it, and especially if you know anything about black powder firearms, has anybody ever fired a black powder firearm? More importantly, has anybody ever cleaned a black powder firearm after you have fired it more than once, right? So black powder is extremely corrosive, and it creates a substance that we just call fouling. So fouling starts uh, when it's hot, and it's more or less a thin coating of like paint, and as it dries, it hardens. So everything about firearm technology up until about the 1870s is completely roadblocked by the fact that you have to deal with black powder fouling. So if you've ever seen a Western that's set in like the 1870s and people just blast in their Winchester and they never have to reload it and they never have to clean it, the thing is, if you've ever taken a, I, I have a friend who, with a Winchester and I asked him, can I, can I take your rifle to the range with a bunch of black powder uh, cartridges and fire it until it breaks? And he told me no. <laughs> but the thing is, if you fire it 20 or 30 times and then don't clean it, it will not work the next day. It won't. The, the levering mechanism is just too clogged up with basically, it's like dry clay, right? So guns weren't this like magical thing that suddenly changed the way that everybody looked at violence. They were just another tool to do the job. And we're gonna talk about pistol dueling, we're gonna talk a little bit about some peculiar American um, kinds of dueling that use black powder firearms, but for the most part, we're gonna concentrate on the culture of fencing, right? And by that, I mostly mean like, we are all part of a culture of fencing, right? But it's an arguable case that there is a culture of fencing that really exists in any meaningful way, right? Like, fencing is like the Olympics. Everybody talks about fencing around the Olympics, and then two months after the Olympics, no one talks about fencing again, right? It's not something that we look at as like, if you see somebody who's a modern fencer, you probably have very different connotations about the kind of person they are and, and the kind of athlete they are than you would about this guy if you were looking at him in 1897, right? because the culture is totally different. The way people look at fencing, the way people treat fencing as an art and as a science and as a sort of expression of masculinity or expression of performance is totally different today. And mostly, we'll get around to it, but mostly what we have to blame for that is the First World War. Because it turns out when you kill whole generations of young men who have certain masculine ideas and you just butcher them on battlefields for years and years and years, those ideas about kind of aristocratic nobility and puissance and all that other stuff, more or less you leave that on the battlefield, right? It's a massive, massive cultural trauma, and we're still basically living in, this, in its shadow even today, right? So 
that's all sort of preamble. So to get into this, we're going to talk a little bit about how the culture of armies changed, right? Because fencing is still related to the military, it's still related to armies, it's still related to campaigning and fighting wars, but it's in slightly different ways as it goes through uh, the century. So if we go back to Meyer's time, 1560s and 70s, almost every single army in Europe, unless you're in France, is hired by, is formed by hiring mercenaries, right? So mercenaries are nice because mercenaries already exist. So I go to somebody who I know, I say, hey, you got a bunch of, you got some goons I can hire? And yeah. you're like, hell yeah, I do. And then that's it, that's the army. We shove you into a group with another bunch of, they literally call them heaps, haufen, the German word, it literally means like pile or heap. It's untidy, right? There's a, there's a type of German village called the Haufenberg that is literally an untidy village, that's what it means. It's just sort of cluttered and unplanned and hasty, and that's the connotation you should have about mercenaries. But the thing about mercenaries is, they're relatively inexpensive compared to having a standing army, certainly. Uh, and mercenaries have their own kind of peculiar sort of legal structure, especially German and Swiss mercenaries. So when you hire them, you basically say, like, you're just going to fight my battles for me, and any problems that you have with discipline or whatever, you can deal with that. Now, in the 1580s, people were fighting what we call the Dutch War, or the Dutch uh, Rebellion, the Dutch Revolt, uh, the 80 Years War. It's essentially Dutch rebels are fighting against the Spanish. The Spanish have their own tercios. A tercio is, guess what? It's, it's literally just a name for a group of guys. It's not a formation. It's not special tactics. It's just what they call the group of armed men. Tercio. Uh, in any case, Maurice of Nassau, who's a sort of Dutch reformer, starts reforming the way that they hire and kind of uh, keep mercenaries around. And one of the big reforms he makes is that you no longer have that legal protection where your discipline within the Haufen is meted out by people within that group. Now it's the responsibility of the person who's in charge of all of the armies of the Dutch reform, the Dutch state's army, they call it. So by getting rid of those sort of legal protections, it basically means that if you screw up, Maurice of Nassau can hang you. Whereas before, Maurice of Nassau has to go and ask your commander to hang you. And mo most of the time, guess what they say? No. Or they say, well, maybe I'll consider it if you pay me. And guess what one of the major problems is in fighting wars in this period? Expensive. Nobody has any money. And you can make all sorts of promises, and you can say, oh, we'll pay you this, we'll pay you that. Mostly what you pay mercenaries with was booty, which means that they have to go around fighting. They have to go around doing something. And if you have failed to pay them, and they're camped near a town that's friendly, it doesn't matter, because they'll go take it from those guys, right? Uh, if you see people walking around this weekend with chickens hanging from their belt, <laughs> this is all a result of last year we were talking about this kind of culture, right? Where it's like you're more or less spending on your own because no one, there is no organization on earth, at least in Europe, that has the kind of money or logistics to keep armies together for any length of time before they start disintegrating, right? And the big change toward what we see in the 18th and 19th century starts in about 1570, 1580, with Maurice of Nassau and the Dutch reforms. So you still have voluntary recruitment. These are still not like conscript armies. Uh, but they are now socially and legally reformed, which means they are now brought kind of under the control of the state, of the nascent state, right? Um, and this, this didn't all happen overnight, right? Um, you can look at the, the, the Dutch state's army themselves were kind of modeling their um, pattern on the French. And the French had all, this had been in extant in France for hundreds of years already. Um, they had a very different military culture than the Swiss or the Germans. But this is a really big part of why Wars in the 18th century were fought the way they were, right? Because wars in the 18th century are not fought with mercenaries, they're fought with not conscripts, but state armies that are run under state auspices, right? So mercenaries essentially turn into soldiers over the course of about the 17th century. So if we want to kind of point at anything, obviously we have the 1580 or so, the Dutch reforms, and then the end of the Thirty Years' War. A lot more states are looking for better ways to control and discipline their soldiers. Um, if you go and look on like the Wikipedia page for the Dutch States, Army, Dutch States Army, one thing it'll say is, oh, they reformed their training. Bullshit. Total bullshit. They never did anything with training. Training wasn't a thing anyone was concerned about until basically the end of the 18th century. Um, all of these were, were legal and social reforms and different ways to not pay their soldiers. That's essentially, and I'm being a little flippant about it, but that's the reality, is that the state is always looking for a way to have their cake and eat it too. They want the army, but they don't want to pay it. 
Um, so they're trying to come up with all sorts of different ways to pay soldiers, to keep them around, and more or less, they, the answer they had was, if you give us the right to hang them, they'll be more disciplined. Mm. And if you look at the um, colonialism, imperialism, wars between uh, Europeans and indigenous peoples all around the world, the biggest thing that made a difference in warfare was not training, it wasn't weaponry, it, it was logistics to an extent, but it was the, the sense of discipline, right? Um, what the United States Army is doing to Native Americans in the 19th century isn't eradicating them, although that is physically what's happening. What they're thinking they're doing is disciplining them. They're bringing them into discipline, right? So discipline and the ability for your commander to legally beat you, to legally stop your pay, to legally cut your head off or hang you, that is what reforms the military in Europe, right? It's nothing about training or technology or weaponry. It's all literally about the ability that your commander has to just do what he wants to. Right? And removing that ability that uh, mercenaries have to essentially strike. And, you know, we can get into sort of like the moral greatness of all of this, but if you have signed a contract that says you're expected to be paid and fed and on and on, right, and none of that happens, what do you do? Right? You strike. And what does a mercenary strike look like? If they don't fight? Sometimes they don't fight, yeah. They fight oh, they they just they just Yeah, they go, they go to the nearest town and they take what they want from them, right? And so that's, that's the sense that we should have from kind of leaving the 16th century into the 17th, is that that's what armies are. And everything about the way that the United States, we're going to talk about the United States a lot, kind of forms their army and has their sort of military establishment is all about ideas that were formed in the Thirty Years' War and before about the way that armies just fundamentally are, right? So, we have a sense that, that soldiers become more expendable, they become more controllable, they become more disciplined, but we also have to deal with the fact that we still have an aristocracy. And we still have an aristocracy that believes it is their God-given right to fight wars, right? So, does anybody know who this is? So this is a guy named Jeffrey Amherst, and both of these uh, portraits are Jeffrey Amherst, right? So, he was a guy I know about him from Michigan because he used to he used to cause a Pontiac rebellion in 1763. Um, but you can see he values the sense that he thinks he's a knight, right? He's got a portrait of himself. I doubt he even owned that armor, but he has a portrait of himself in armor, right? He is a knight. He is a lord. He's somebody who firmly believes that as a gentleman, it is his job to lead soldiers. 200 years before this, he would have been one of Meyer's students. He would have been somebody who's swinging swords around and kind of showing off his martial prowess, but he's not necessarily going to go lead a regiment in battle. But by the 18th century, this is what essentially the second estate is doing. Is no longer, they're, not, they're not any longer just like serving in wars or doing anything like that, but their responsibility is to lead men, is to discipline men in armies. And so instead of knights, they're still knights, even though it's kind of less important. Um, but they still see their role as war fighting. And they see their role particularly as disciplining soldiers, because they're not soldiers, they're knights. They're colonels, they're officers. And officers are generally, at least in the British model, and to some extent the American, but the British model especially, anyone who leads a regiment is doing it because they want to. They actually have to pay for the privilege of doing it, right? And if you read uh, books about like the American Revolution and everything, people will be like, oh, what a, what a nonsense system, like making people pay for this, making people pay for their promotions and everything. But if you have uh, a military establishment that only works <coughs> with volunteers, and it only works with voluntary action from aristocrats, this is the way that you actually kind of separate the wheat from the chaff. Ambrose is going to take it seriously. So he's the guy that you want to be in charge. And you're not just going to like let somebody because of their title come in and take over, right? It doesn't quite work that way, although there are some exceptions. Um, field officers in this period, even up to the First World War, are expected to lead from the front. They are expected to be out in front, often with a sword held high, uh, and they are expecting to be shot at. They're expecting that people are going to point their cannons at them. They're expecting that people are going to try to shoot them from really far away. Uh, but that is, that's the appeal. That's what they want to be seen as a person willing to take that kind of risk. It's the same sort of sense that we get from people who are going and fighting effectually, right? It's the ability to stand there and show off your ability to take punishment and to give up punishment, right? And so, a lot of the ways that, that military action was thought of is not necessarily anything about soldiers or discipline or training or anything like that. It's, it's all of these guys, right? Colonel so-and-so led his regiment 
you know, affiliate lead, blah, blah, blah. It has nothing to do with the soldiers, of course. They didn't do anything. They, they just did what they were told. It's these guys, these guys like Amherst, that are, that are kind of the beating heart of the military in this period. So this is about where we're going to start, right? So 1688 or so, this is kind of the culture that we have of martiality of the military, of armies and war fighting, is that you've got a whole bunch of just probably vagrants. Um, I've deliberately avoided talking about the enclosure system or the enclosure movement that was going on, but that essentially created what we see as armies of this period, right? If you dispossess people uh, and now, you know, they no longer have access to their well, they no longer have access to the commons because you're closing them out and forming up a mine, well, you've got a choice. You can be a miner or you can be a vagrant. And if you're a vagrant, guess what? We can throw you into the army or we can send you across to the colonies. You can go to Barbados and die of yellow fever. They don't care. They just want you out of London. Because if your little village is now enclosed, it's now owned by one person rather than the commons, and you got nowhere to go because you can't afford your rent now, and you go to London and you're just kind of kicking around as a vagrant, and they collar you, toss you a ship, and you end up somewhere. And that's what was going on. So those are soldiers. Soldiers don't matter. These guys matter because they're the ones that are going to take those vagrants and these people who don't matter, and they're going to turn them into soldiers, right? And then that, then you can be kind of prideful about it, but it's it's only after the process of discipline, right? And that's centrally important to this period of warfare. Um, fencing, obviously, uh, is still a big part of at least being an officer, right? When you look at most of these portraits, I'm not actually sure if you can see one there on Ambrose, but most of these guys have something knightly in their portrait. Right? Not everybody's going to be wearing armor like this, but most of them are going to have a sword. Um, sword uh, officers on battlefields carry swords. Um, officers in the military, even into the like, mid-19th century, are still potentially fighting duels with swords, rather than pistols, which is really popular among the civilians. And with that in mind, we're going to talk a little bit about oh, yeah. military versus civilian. So who knows who that guy is? Oh, yeah, so that's Colonel Thomas Monster, right? So, Colonel Thomas Monstry is, as you can see, not wearing a military uniform. What do we call it? Is he a civilian? I mean, yeah, he's not currently in the army. He wasn't in the army, like, any time after about the 1840s. What he was, was a filibuster. Does anybody know what that is? It's not somebody who's just standing out in front of Congress talking and talking and talking forever until everybody goes away. These are people who are generally invading foreign countries with illegal armies that they're paying themselves and trying to expand the franchise of slavery in South America. That's more, more or less what's happening with filibusters. And Monstry was part of it. Monstry had nothing at all to say about slavery. He had a lot to say about liberalism, he had a lot to say about the church, but he had nothing at all to say about slavery. He's happily fighting with really notorious scumbag slavers just because that's where he gets his kicks, right? But he was part of the, the Danish Navy. He tried to join the American Navy. Um, he was actually wounded in the Mexican-American War, but he was a crewman on board a contracted ship rather than a ship that was actually in service of the United States Navy. So this is a guy who fights wars. This is a guy who very, very, very much believes in his sense of being an aristocrat, of his, of his sense of being of belonging to the second estate. Um, he is obviously a peerless fencer. This is a guy who fought something like 50 duels that we absolutely know he absolutely did. Um, and in general, he's just... Like, this man was made to be a fencer, right? But we have this weird distinction, right? Because a lot of times you'll hear discussions about fencing in this period, and it's, you know, it's military saber versus dueling saber, or it's civilian saber, or gymnasium saber, or whatever. It's all saber. It's all the same. They don't treat it any differently in the period. There is no real distinction between civilian and military, because, in, at least in the English-speaking part of the world, uh, armies rapidly expand with volunteers, and any kind of... Um, like military establishment in these countries is generally very, very big. <coughs> and most of the men who are interested in being part of the military are probably part of the militia. If you're part of the militia and you're an officer in the militia, you get benefits, right? You get social benefits, especially in, in like the United States. You're probably not expecting to go fight a lot of wars, but if you're in Wisconsin in the 1830s, you might be fighting the Black Hawks War. If you're in the frontier anywhere from then on until the end of the century, you might actually have to have to do things like Know, fight Native Americans. You might have to respond to, uh, by the 20th century, most of what the militia's doing is cracking down on strikes. That's what the militia's role was, and that turned into the National Guard. Um, so we have this kind of sense that there's something 
potent and valuable and different between the way that the military approaches fencing and the way that civilians approach fencing. But when your army rapidly expands and everybody who's doing most of the fighting are all civilians, or were two weeks ago, the distinction does not matter. And especially if you're living in a culture that has a militia tradition, most of the, most of the men of like Monstry's character are already studying the military. They're already part of militias, they're already part of the militia leadership, they're already part of military training to the extent that it exists in the period. Um, they, they would find it very weird that we make such a, such a firm distinction between soldiers and warfare and stuff and civilians. They wouldn't see it that way at all. They would see that their role is to be a soldier when, it, when they need to be, and then they, they hook their musket back, back up on the shelf and go back to their job after the war. Right? And we see that happening like in the Civil War and various other conflicts in the United States. <coughs> so one of the things I do want to point out is that career soldiers are not necessarily better at fighting wars than civilians are. And again, people are like, what? That doesn't make sense. But the military, they do all their training. Um, guess what you're mostly studying if you go to West Point in this period? Engineering. Engineering. Yeah, you're going to build bridges, you're going to build trains, you're going to build canals. That's what you're being trained for, right? You're also going to learn how to speak French. Why might you want to learn how to speak French? It was popular at the time, but most of the good engineering books are written in French, and most of the good fencing books are written in French. Um, West Point actually taught, uh, taught French your first two years you learned French. Uh, so every single officer in the United States who went through West Point past about the 1840s is probably fluent in French too. Um, so again, if you're looking for, if you want to do like military saber of the mid 19th century, just find a civilian French manual. That's probably closer to what they're studying than almost anything else. Even West Point mastered the sword, which is still the title that they have for their athletic director today. Um, were until 1882, almost every single master of the sword was a civilian with a French name. It's, it's guys like Dupont and, and you know, Jean Pierre. There's about 14 Jean Pierres, right? But so that's that's more or less what's happening. You have this sort of cadre uh, of peacetime armies that are super idiosyncratic, they're really dogmatic, and they're kind of socially isolated. Um, so if you're a West Pointer, who knows most of the other West Pointers, right? This is why when the Civil War starts, all of the, the really high commands go to West Pointers. Not because they're better at fighting wars because those are the guys that everybody who's making the decisions know, right? And there are plenty of examples of uh, officers in the American Civil War who had absolutely no military background at all, who turned out to be absolutely perfect war fighters. And there are tons of examples of really terrible West Point graduates who are awful at fighting wars. So that kind of distinction, again, is for the most part a false dichotomy. So now we're going to talk about fencing, finally. So, starting in about the early 18th century, it probably predates that by quite a lot, we have a lot of uh, gladiator fights in the Bear Garden. So this is in England, predominantly. Now, who's heard of a guy named Donald McBain? So Donald McBain fought something like 30 uh, gladiator prizes in the Bear Pits. So these were uh, the, bear pit, the Bear Gardens. This is where they used to be bear baiting. You know what bear baiting is? Yeah. You take a bear, you get a bunch of dogs, and then you Sick the dogs on the bear, and you bet on how many how many dogs the bear kills before the bear dies. That's what people did for fun, right? And they did it in a place called Hockney in the Hole. And Hockney in the Hole, in the Bear Gardens, they also had a big stage where they had gladiator fights. So gladiator fights are really interesting because they're a peculiar mix of uh, sort of super over violence, but also very controlled performance. So. A lot of the people who go to Bear Gardens and like write newspaper articles about their experience there talk about how skillful these guys were and how much blood is flying through the air. And so if you imagine somebody like Donald McBain, your job when you're going up and fencing in the Bear Gardens is to put on as good a show as you possibly can. It's probably going to include actual blood flying around uh, the gladiator pit. But you also don't want to kill anybody. Because if you kill somebody, you could be sued. And you might actually have to sacrifice a prize purse. And you might actually have to talk to like a constable, and you may be charged for murder, right? So you don't want to kill the other person, but you want to put on a show that looks like you will, right? And if you can imagine anywhere going into fencing, prove to an audience that's paying, and they expect to see a good show, that you are willing to kill the person that you're fencing, make it look very serious, and like one of you is inches from death, and then leave perfectly safe with everybody being friends. 
Does that sound easier or harder than going to a HEMA tournament? Harder. It's much harder. It's way harder. Um, and the guys who became these kind of gladiators, like Donald Payne, became very famous. They're almost like WWE guys. Um, they, they kind of talk themselves up in newspaper articles ahead of time. They go through this sort of ritual of dueling, right? Where a duel never just starts because people want to kill each other. It starts because of an insult that somebody refuses to apologize for. So the Bear Gardens have these, when, when you're really promoting a big fight between two very famous gladiators, what you do is you put newspaper articles ahead of time in the newspaper and you say, Donald McBain was a grenadier and he fought in nine years war. He blew himself up with a hand grenade and then he fought 19 Dutchmen all at once. And he's going to be fighting this guy over here, who's also, he you know, was on board the, the, the HMS whatever during whatever battle or whatever. And the idea is, you get as many people interested as possible so more people go and buy tickets. But you also, again, the more you talk up the performance, the better it has to be. Because this is a period in the, the early 18th century where you're always about this far away from a riot. Right? <laughs> and there are some riots that were started because of things that happened during gladiator fights in the Bear Gardens. Um, not all of them have anything to do with the actual fencing that was going on, but a lot of them have to do with things that are happening in the crowd and all sorts of other stuff. But that's kind of the, the culture that you have to expect, right? Like, imagine the next time you go to a HEMA tournament, the first person that you fight, there is a crowd of people, they all have tomatoes, they've all paid to be there, right? And if you don't put on the show that they expect, you're going to get beamed by those tomatoes, and you might get assaulted by people with sticks and whatever else they have around. That's the reality, right? And so imagine that amount of pressure on you every time you just go to fest, right? It's, it's weird, and it's interesting, and it's idiosyncratic, and it's something that kind of not only highlights the artfulness of fencing, but also its possibility of violence. And it's like the idea is that you want to you want to promote the idea that this is super deadly and serious and, and people are going to die without actually doing that, right? And that's a really difficult line to tread, but it was very popular for a long time. Um, we also see kind of overlapping uh, this period. We start to see challenge matches. And these are, are, are connected to like the gladiator thing, right? It's the same sort of thing. You, you promote in the newspaper, I'm going to have this guy come over here and we're going to fight. And he's famous for these reasons, and I'm famous for these reasons, and we're just going to go have a challenge. And many of these challenge matches are lengthy. They involve multiple weapons. They involve um, like a lot of exhibition displays. So you might have a guy come out and you know you got a dozen oranges or whatever, and he does a bunch of tricks with a saber and all the oranges to show like, oh, his sword's super sharp. And then you go back behind a curtain, you swap to the dull one, right? Um, but they'll fight something like twelve passes with the foil, twelve passes with the backsword, twelve passes with the saber, twelve passes with the rapier, twelve passes like, and they'll just go on and on and on. And so again, imagine the next time you go to a human tournament, every single bout that you're fencing, you're fencing back to back with the same person in front of the same crowd for four hours. Right? It's exhausting. It's hard. It's brutal. And that's the kind of fencing that people expect to see when they go to these things. And not only that, but it has to be skillful. Right? If you go out there and you start doubling all the time, people are going to be really annoyed because that's shitty. Nobody came here to pay for a shitty show. They want to see skill. They want to see performance. They want to see people who are good at this. Um, and this kind of leads into, eventually we have what they call Grand Assaults. So a Grand Assault is like Colonel Thomas Monstry fought many of these. He would put out a challenge, usually to a French fencer, and they would find a huge venue. Uh, we're talking like Madison Square Gardens, like huge, huge venues with hundreds or thousands of people attending. Uh, and they would find a referee, and they would fight it was something like uh, Monstri had a, a, a bad time fencing one of these French masters because they, they ended up getting a shitty referee who was making all the bad calls and everything. But it was something like the first person to get to a certain number of points, and you win a certain number of points for winning bouts with different weapons. But they went through like everything. They went through foil, saber, backsword. Um, in the 19th century, they had a weapon they called the rapier, which I think is really interesting because the rapier's distinction was there's a period where the, the set of weapons that you have are usually small sword, which you thrust with, back sword, which you cut with. Sometimes the saber replaced the back sword, sometimes it's a different word, sometimes it's a broad sword, things like that. But you've got a weapon that pokes, you've got a weapon that cuts. And then in the early 18th century, it was the spadroon, and eventually they called it the rapier. And the rapier's distinction was it cuts and thrusts. 
So take that back to fencing when you go back to your club and do Italian rapier and they tell you don't ever cut because it's fucking nonsense. The rapier has always been a sword that can cut and thrust. Um, even Giganti actually says that most people don't know how to fence, so they use a lot of cuts, right? So if you're doing Italian rapier, you're not actually training defense against cuts and how to cut effectively. You're learning like a third of what you should be learning, right? Um, anyway, that's a digression. But Monster would, would do this kind of thing. Sometimes he would toss in, like, let's go a few rounds of boxing, or uh, let's throw in some bayonet stuff. This is actually a picture from one of Monstery's uh, uh, exhibitions, and you can see a guy with a saber fencing a guy with uh, a bayonet. So a lot of the discussions that you might see on Reddit or Facebook or something about the efficacy of certain weapons and certain weapons against other ones, they're still doing that in the 18th and 19th centuries, too, because they're just as interested in, well, what if it's real, right? And this is still a period where people are dying to swords on battlefields and in duels and almost everywhere around the world except Britain and the United States. And in Britain and the United States, it's very performative, but it's, they still consider it a vital and important part about being a man. You might not always be a fencer, but there are ways for you to perform your masculinity in, in ways that kind of reify it and support these ideas, right? So, Teddy Roosevelt, famous fencer. Teddy Roosevelt, when he was president, would actually have bouts of single stick on the White House lawn with friends of his. Um, there are a couple of times that he like missed really important state meetings because like his fingers got bashed in and he had to like go to the doctor or whatever. Um, so Roosevelt kind of promoted these ideas, right? Like cudgel and single stick and boxing and wrestling as a way to, to promote masculine values in the United States at a time where he thought they were on the way. So fencing is still a vitally important part about being a man. Right? It's something that, that people consider very important and a, and a part of sort of the fluency with violence that you're expected to have as a person interested in sort of martiality. Right? If you're a militia officer and you're not fencing, well, you're, you're not doing everything that you could be doing to be a, a better citizen. Right? And it's all connected to these kind of really big, broader ideas. So, by about the early 18th century, mid 18th century, so um, most people are no longer fencing are no longer fighting sword duels. The pistol duel is becoming much more important. Obviously, sword duels still exist. They, they, they go hand in hand with dueling generally. But for the most part, by about the mid 18th century, most duels are being settled with pistols. Does anybody know why? Pistols are more fair, right? So maybe not in this environment, but if I were to go back to my hometown, it would be unfair for me to fence anyone in because I spend way more time fencing than anyone else in the city, right? It wouldn't be fair. But it would be fair if we both had a black powder pistol that, you know, it's not super duper inaccurate, but they're, they're inaccurate enough that it's fair. It's inaccurate enough that God can get in there and decide what happened, right? Um, and that's largely the idea, right? Pistol duels were actually paradoxically safer than sword duels. And a lot of this is because if you start a lunge, it's really hard to stop it. If, if a sword gets, gets in there a couple, three inches or so, that guy might die, and there's nothing you can do about it. Obviously, you can still die if you get shot with a pistol, but it's a lot easier for me to perform the role of duelist with not intending to harm my opponent with a pistol than it is with a sword, right? Because I can very easily and imperceptibly shift my aim two or three inches and know for a certainty I'm not going to hit the guy. And I have to, I have to be fairly confident he also doesn't want to hit me either. Right? And there's, this isn't about pistol dueling, but there is a lot that goes into that kind of, that phase, right? The, the two factors of the two, more or less. But they were physically safer, um, which does not stop many, many people from dying. Uh, and by, in the United States, after about 1780, pistol duels become very popular. Um, this is the period uh, from about 1780 or so, or 1787, we can put a, real precise date on it, up until about 1815, is sort of the heyday of the American duel. Um, Americans fucking loved dueling. They loved it. We had yeah. presidents who were dueling. We had like naval commanders who were dueling. Um, obviously, Alexander Hamilton died in a duel. His son died in a pistol duel. Um, and this was a very popular, this was kind of like the Americans' version of like the 1590s in England, right? So who's read George Silver, right? George Silver's not necessarily writing a book about how to kill people more effectively because he thinks it's fun. He's doing it because it promotes a specific idea of English nationalism at a time where the English were looking for a way to make their mark on the world because they were a backwater. 
They were somebody who was sometimes, occasionally got brought into continental fights, or continental wars and, and whatnot, and they were always kind of secondary and unimportant. And so Silver is actually saying, no, 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 we shouldn't do what the Italians do because we're just killing our stock of men. We should be killing other people, so stop killing each other, right? So he's actually doing this as a way to prevent people from killing each other, not to promote a better way to do it, which is the way that I mostly see people discuss towards Silver. But he's part of this massive wave of English nationalism, and he's promoting these per particular ideas about dueling and fencing and sword fighting and everything because it's connected to, uh, to larger and broader ideas about citizenship and masculinity and nationalism and Englishism, right? Englishness. Um, and in the United States from about 1787, why 1787? Constitution. Yep. Yeah, and the Constitution gave birth to political parties. And political parties, in this period, they tend to be talked about as if everybody knew who everyone was, right? Oh, I know that you're a Federalist, and I know that you're a Democratic Republican. But they weren't, nobody had like, you didn't have to go sign up to be part of the party. You just hung out with those guys. And if you stop hanging out with those guys, hang out with those guys instead, then maybe your party positions changed too. And the fact that it's so obscure, and the fact that it's very difficult to tell who's on your side and who isn't, is what leads to this sort of masculine crisis that leads to the birth of the American duel, right? So this is why we have guys like Hamilton, who's willing to throw down with Aaron Burr, because it's not about their particular personal dispute, it's about how their personal dispute reflects on their professionalism and their, their, their position within the American government. Um, and when we look at all of the dueling crazes in, in many different nations, all of these things are expressions of tensions that lean very heavily on, on people's sense of themselves and their sense of political belonging, their sense of social belonging. Um, so we don't have like the dueling craze in France in the 1630s just because people like dueling. It's because people are afraid that they might be seen as less manly than the next guy. And if they get challenged, they have to go out and they have to risk being killed because the alternative is social death. Right? And if you die social death, nobody's going to invite you to WNW. You're not teaching there anymore. Right? Like, it's... It, that's a joke, right? But like, if you consider that tomorrow you might be stripped of all of your kind of your professional experience, all of the skills that you've developed, nobody wants to listen to you anymore. That's unbearable, right? And that's what leads people to make decisions to go and duel people and risk dying because the alternative is you die anyway. You're still alive, but socially you're dead, and that's unbearable. People can't take that, right? So dueling's still happening. Um, does anybody know where this kind of goofy thing is sandbar coming from? Sandbar fight. That's the sandbar fight, yeah. yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad all of you know about the sandbar fight. So, Jim Bowie, uh, this may have been the only person Jim Bowie ever killed. Uh, and it was certainly with a, a knife that was not called a Bowie knife at the time. Um, but he was literally pinned to the ground with a sword cane, and then he slid a guy basically from, from nuts to teeth with a knife. And that's probably the only time Jim Bowie ever actually killed anyone, and it's the the reason he's famous, and it's the reason they made a knife about him, was because if you want to slit a guy from balls to teeth, you got to do it with this knife, right? Um, so American duels had some really peculiar sort of expressions, right? Um, in America, so they say, there's no aristocracy, and without a way to to point at your family to say why you're important, you have to prove it, in a way, right? And so this leads to a lot of really weird things. So in American duels, it was much more common to use like rifles than it ever was in Europe. And the thing was, you use a rifle, and you're not standing at eight paces with a rifle because that just guarantees two people are going to die. But you go maybe 40 yards, right? Or you have some other kind of elaborate way of, of deciding this. But you use a rifle because a rifle is something that's considered particularly American, right? Uh, Americans love rifles. They love rifles way before they should have. Because again, with black powder, imagine all that, that fouling fills up with the, the actual uh, twists. It's terrible. The right one, right? It fills it up within like two or three shots. And then because the ball has to actually spin, you have to load in a ball that's very tight to the barrel, and you can fire two or three times, and now you have, again, three coats of paint inside your barrel. You can't load it. Um, so that's why they don't like them as battlefield weapons until basically uh, uh, they invent the mini ball in the 1830s. Um, Anyway, so Americans are much more willing to have duels with things like sword canes. Sword canes are 
like a distinctly American thing. More Americans carry sword canes than almost anywhere else on Earth. And a lot of that comes because there's this massive sort of, there's a, a, a much wider range of ways that American men can be violent than just the duel. Um, has anybody ever heard the term politics out of doors? So politics out of doors is a historiographical way of explaining American riots. Americans love to riot. They love to riot. Uh, they love to, to go smash up the colored section of town. Uh, it's a thing that happens a lot. Um, Baltimore, Maryland, does anybody know the nickname of Baltimore, Maryland? In, in the 1830s, Mob Town. Yeah. And it's called Mob Town because people like mobbing up. They really love it. It's really fun. Um, but if you're having a dispute, so in 1804, there was a, a shooting death of a guy named Charles Austin. Charles Austin was shot to death uh, by a guy named Thomas Selfridge, I think. Thomas Selfridge was a Federalist, and um, Austin was a Democratic Republican. Uh, they got into a dispute, and Selfridge called out Austin. Austin said, I'm not going to duel you. So uh, he, instead of dueling him, he said, I'm going to beat you with a stick in the street. So he started carrying a big old hickory, hickory cane with him and started walking like in company, right? He brought in a bunch of boys with him and swaggering down the street, all of them with big sticks. So Selford says, well, okay, if you're not going to duel me, then I'm going to post you. You know what posting is? They say, if you're not going to duel me, I'm going to put in the newspaper that you are a poltroon. A poltroon oh, means a coward, somebody who's not willing to represent themselves as a man. So he's basically saying, in the newspaper, you shouldn't do business with this guy, you shouldn't interact with this guy. If your daughter's going to marry this guy's son, don't let her. Things like that, right? It's, it's, this is the first kind of expression of what would become social death. So Austin obviously has to respond, or Selfridge has to respond. So he says, I'm getting these two guys confused. Anyway, um, Selfridge ends up carrying a pair of pocket pistols. And he actually puts in the newspaper that he's carrying pocket pistols because he's being threatened in the street by this guy who won't duel him. And Austin ends up coming at him with a hickory stick, and Selfridge shoots him. And it's the first case in American history of self-defense with a pistol. Um, and this kind of thing is happening way more often than duel things happen. Right? That's kind of the point of that story. Even Hamilton had several misfire duels before he ended up dueling anyone who dueled. He dueled like three or four times. Um, so if you are a person who's a duelist, there's still a lot of concern that you might have. If I call Joe out, Joe doesn't want to fight. He's got a lot of ways he can avoid that poltroon stamp, there's a lot of ways that he can still represent himself as a man, and he's probably going to do it in a political way. He's probably going to go round up all his political buddies. So if he's the Federalist, and I'm the Democratic Republican, he's going to go to get his Federalist buddies, and they're going to beat me up, and they're going to beat up my friends, and that's going to kind of keep going. And it's, it's this constant, simmering, paranoid suspicion that's going on with everybody that you can't really trust anyone. And even the people that are close to you now might not be in a couple of weeks, because again, the, these political parties are very malleable, and they, they change overnight, and there's no way to really predict what's going to happen in two weeks from now, right? So again, we have this kind of idea that it's masculinity in crisis, and that's what's leading to this expression of fighting and dueling and, and whatnot. So that's all still happening, all more or less until about the Civil War. We, we start seeing a lot fewer what we might consider proper duels after the Civil War, although we also do have in 1864, do you even know what happened in 1864? That was, or it was 1865? Abe Lincoln was shot. Well, obviously, Abe Lincoln was shot, yeah. Um, in sort of the history of the duel, and maybe the history of, think about Westerns. Is it the invention of the revolver? Not the invention of the revolver, that's the 1830s. Okay. And those are mostly for Texas Rangers. Um, yeah, so that was the, the Colt Walker Dragoon, they called it, um, was the first kind of practical revolver that was going around. But in 1865, a guy named um, he eventually was called Wild Bill Haycock. Uh, shot a guy in the streets of St. Louis in 1865. And it was more or less the first kind of the idea of the quick draw revolver duel that happened in 1865. However, plenty of people, including politicians, were fighting duels with revolvers well before the Civil War. And there were even uh, at least one Civil War general who murdered someone with a revolver before the war and then was acquitted for it because he, he it was the first case in the United States where somebody pled insanity because he caught his wife with a lover, and he killed the lover days later. He <laughs> shot him in the street. Um, sure been crazy. Yeah, uh, and that guy's also infamous because he's the guy that screwed up Gettysburg. He's uh, uh, Daniel Sickles, whose leg is at the Smithsonian, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, 
I'm talking a lot about America because I have a master's degree in American political history of the 19th century, so that's why we're kind of focusing on this. But I think it is it gives a good window into this violent culture that still exists, and this is why people still consider fencing something that's very important. And it's not just because it's athletic and it's artful and it's a way to, to kind of train your mind as well as your body and to be graceful and, and all this, but it's also because you might actually have somebody trying to stab you with a sword cane, and your only alternative is to fight them with a buck knife, right? That's happening. It's happening especially on the fringes, on the, on the frontier of the United States. That is very possible. And it's a way that, that American men specifically are kind of trying to train themselves against any exigency, right? So, American fencing. Um, fencing has been a part of the United States uh, since it wasn't the United States, since uh, kind of colonial uh, times. Anybody know who that guy is? Today? So his name is Thomas Stevens. And I have Thomas Stevens up there because Thomas Stevens was actually the, uh, the militia uh, inspector general of the, the, the state militia of Wisconsin in the 1860s. So he was actually ended up being a Civil War general. He wrote a book about fencing in the 1860s. Um, it was, so Stevens actually served in the Queen's Guard in England before he immigrated to the United States. So he actually had a lot of military experience and he had a lot of fencing experience. And one of the things about the Queen's Guards was it's sort of like the Three Musketeers, where in all of their spare time, they're just like in a hotel hanging out, fencing. That's all they do all day, all the time. And then, and then they go and they stand there like this and guard the Queen. Um, so Stevens comes to Wisconsin and he says, none of these bozos know how to fence. So I'm going to basically rewrite Roworth and put my name on it, and then he becomes the Inspector General of the Wisconsin State Militia. And people in the militia all around the United States are doing things like this, right? Uh, the United States military does not have a fencing, uh, like it doesn't have a fencing style. It doesn't have a, a specific fencing book. It has the master fence at West Point, that's it. If you're uh, just a trooper in the cavalry serving out in a fort in Arizona somewhere, you maybe might learn how to fence if your officer is interested in teaching you. And that's it. That's more or less how it happens, uh, at least in the military. But masculine uh, culture in the colonies and sort of the idea of American masculinity is influenced largely by indigenous masculinity. And one of the ways that Americans can make themselves distinct not only from the indigenous but also from Europeans is to kind of take some of those characteristics and make them a part of American culture while at the same time violently murdering all the indigenous that are around you uh, and also killing the British during the War of 1812, that kind of thing. Um, but it, it makes American masculinity seem unique, right? It's a way to it's a way to, to kind of make yourself distinct from the rest of the milieu out there, right? And it becomes a big part of what eventually became American culture. So one of the things to understand about the sort of military establishment, at least in the English-speaking world, uh, in the 19th century was that both the British and the Americans hated spending money on the military. Hated um, And the, the United States Army prior to uh, prior to the Civil War had 16,000 men in it. That's it. So who knows how many people died at Gettysburg? More than 16,000. 16, yeah. Uh, 16,000 men is about the size of one pretty large division by about 1860. So it's puny, it's tiny. And even in 1859, most of that army is scattered off in the territories, in the West. So you have your group of like 100 guys, that's probably more like 70, because of recruiting was poor, retention was very poor, and desertion was really high, because of no, you might sound like it's very adventurous to go out there and serve in the cavalry, and then you get to a post in Arizona, and there's not enough wood, because guess what, <laughs> there's no trees there. Um, you're not getting enough food, you're bored all the time, uh, and maybe you might have a, a sadistic officer who's getting you to swing sticks at each other every single day too, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very small scattered military, and this is one of the reasons I brought up before, people in the military don't necessarily, they're not necessarily good at war, right? One of the most common things, especially in warfare past the start of the 18th century, is that no military on earth has ever been prepared for the war ahead of fight, mm -hmm. none whatsoever. None at all, right? And so the American Army, when it started, uh, or the United States Army, the Federal Army, when it started fighting in uh, the American Civil War, was woefully unprepared for everything. But then, so was the Southern, the Rebel Army. They were woefully unprepared for everything too, because most of their men, are, or most of their officers, are trained as engineers, not soldiers. 
They might know some military theory. They probably know military theory actually quite well. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're any good at like feeding their men when they need to be fed or leading them away from uh, morale crises and making sure that your officers aren't dueling each other and making sure that the, uh, the men that, you're, that are in your um, volunteer regiment have elected the right officers because the volunteer regiments elected their own officers, right? And what's one way that if you are uh, somebody interested in the militia, 1861 happens, Fort Sumter happens, you and all your boys go up to volunteer for the federal for federal service. How do you make yourself distinct among two or three or four thousand other people who are also trying to buy for those those sort of coveted honorable positions of being the captain of your company or the colonel of a regiment? What's one way you can make yourself distinct? Being a really good fencer. That's one way. And there are plenty of people who sort of like they would they had these uh they would muster up right. They was called a, a muster. So you. you the idea was, in federal service, uh, all the militias would come up and they would form companies. And those companies would then be put together into a regiment, and then the regiment would be accepted into federal service. So it has this kind of long legal process. And while that's all going on, you just have like a couple hundred dudes in tents, or maybe not even in tents, just hovering around town. And what do you think they're get, getting up to? It's not, they're not drilling. <laughs> they're not learning, they're not like reading up on their military theory. They're out there hanging out with their buddies, right? They're having WMAW right outside. And then after three or four days, then they're going to elect their officers. Those officers will be accepted or not. And then the, the company or the regiment as a whole will be accepted into federal service and brigaded into a brigade and a sense somewhere. So it's a long process, right? And you have men like Stevens who are trying to get these prominent positions within uh, these newly forming volunteer regiments. And rightly or wrongly, uh, most of them want to be officers rather than just men. Um, and another way you can kind of make yourself distinct is if you have any kind of veteran service. So there were plenty of uh, people who were veterans of the Mexican-American War um, who were elected, obviously, into positions uh, of, of command who came to this. So fencing is still a part of all of this. It's still going on for a really long time. And fencing, even at West Point, was, was taught as a practical skill. This is taught as a way to kind of train officers into making difficult decisions because fencing is something that it makes your mind elastic, right? It's something that's it's all about novelty and vagaries and, and fine super distinctions that you still need to know what to do with. And when you look at the way wars are fought in this period, it's all about this novelty. It's all about how you deal with problems that you could not possibly have anticipated because you end up in a place where there are rocks where you didn't know there were rocks. So how do you get rid of a bunch of rocks? Well, you can waste all your black powder for it, or you have a whole bunch of engineers who are leading groups of what are essentially armed laborers. That's what war is in the 1860s. And when you look at the American Civil War, it is fought in this very artful way where officers are very, very clear about the advantages they see in their position and the disadvantages of their opponent. These are talked about in letters and memoirs and everything. One of my favorite memoirs is uh, written by a guy named uh, Frederick Lyman Hitchcock. And Hitchcock was, uh, he was the adjunct or the adjutant of the 103rd, I think, 100, he was Pennsylvania Volunteer Regiment that was mustered into service for three months. Uh, he had the misfortune of being in command of his regiment at the Battle of Fredericksburg. Um, he was also not only, so the Battle of Fredericksburg, we're going to take a, a bit to talk about it. So uh, Hitchcock was actually part of the uh, the faint in force, which was actually supposed to storm Mary's Heights. Except that it wasn't supposed to storm Mary's Heights. It was supposed to make it look like they wanted to storm Mary's Heights, while the rest of the army went around and did something else. So it was to fix rebel attention on this really shitty idea of attacking uphill against a stone wall. And everybody who went on the battlefield that day, including Hitchcock, knew that his role was to be a sacrifice. And uh, in his terms, he called it a mad sacrifice of men. But the idea was, as long as we are here and still standing, all the rebels' attention is here, and the rest of the boys are going to go out and, and figure all that out. It didn't end up working for various reasons, but this is not a war where you just have guys stupidly standing there getting shot down in droves. They are all trying to do something. They're all trying to take advantage of a situation that they have. And when you start thinking about it like this, you start thinking about it in fencing terms. And if you can parse, this is what my lecture tomorrow is all about, by the way. Not necessarily the Civil War, but this, this lack of distinction between fencing as an art and warfare as an art. Because it is an art. 
it is something that's knowable. And it's, if you're fighting a peer, uh, a peer conflict, like the American Civil War or the First World War, you're making weird decisions that people 60, 70 years later are not going to have any hope of understanding unless they really immerse themselves in studying this because it seems invisible and it seems like a mad sacrifice of men. Every time I've ever heard anybody talk about Fredericksburg, it's always about the storm of Mary's Heights and this, again, mad sacrifice. And they forget that that was done on purpose to allow another part of the army to take a greater advantage against the rebels. It just didn't work, right? And that happens way more often than anyone just decides to just send guys forward and not give them orders and wait until everybody dies. That's not how war was fought. Because war was fought by gentlemen who believed that it was their God-given right to command armies. And they took it very seriously. Not everybody was very good at it, right, like Dan Sickles, but they took it seriously and they made decisions that we can parse, for instance, using the five words. We can do it, and that's what we're going to do tomorrow. Um, any questions about this so far? I know I've mostly just kind of rambled, but you seem to be able to that, right? So, uh, 1890s firearm technology are rapidly improved. I could talk about this for about three or four hours. Um, so, the 1890s is the first time we start seeing the proliferation of smokeless powder. And the big change that smokeless powder brings is now you don't have to worry about black powder fouling. So now we can have things like machine guns, and now we can have things like rapid fire submachine guns, and handheld weapons that you can fire a rifle hundred, you know, more, way more than you can with black powder before you have to clean it. Um, that's one of the big, that's one of the reasons that, that um, the First World War is so bloody and brutal, is because this is the first time that every, every army that's fighting is equipped with, for the most part, not black powder weaponry, but also more importantly, every single person of those nations is involved in the war somehow, right? So when you see the First World War, it's not necessarily just that technology improved, it's that technology improved and now millions of people have these better rifles and all of them have a uniform and all of them are on the battlefield and all of them are, are at least partially trained in order to kill the enemy, right? It's not necessarily just a technological thing, it's a social thing as well, it's a cultural thing. It's, a, it's about changing ideas about how we fight wars and whose responsibility it is to fight wars. Because prior to the First World War, it was the aristocracy and volunteer soldiers. And by the First World War, it's everyone. Everyone. Right? We still have draft laws because of this stuff. Right? And there is a possibility that, I mean, probably not most of us, because I think most of us are probably a little older than the Army wants, right? But um, it's possible that we could see a draft in our lifetime in the United States. It's possible. It's unlikely, but it's possible. And that's because. The ideas about whose responsibility it is to protect the state has changed. Now it's all our job, all the time. Even though before that it was about the aristocracy and people who made it their purpose to defend the state. So it's very different. Um, in America especially, uh, I mentioned Teddy Roosevelt earlier. He had this whole thing called that he called um, the strenuous life. And again, he saw masculinity in crisis by the end of the century, and he saw that American men, uh, especially, were, were whips and losers. And he wanted to promote the idea that you should you should be out there boxing, and you should be wrestling, you should be playing football. Um, in about 1912, I think, uh, there was his college-age son was playing football at college, uh, and his mother was like, he shouldn't play football because kids are literally dying. Their necks are breaking, they're getting horrible concussions. And Roosevelt basically said, mm, he should toughen up and do it anyway because it will make him a better man. And this is the same kid who died as a pilot in the First World War who emotionally broke Teddy Roosevelt. He died about two years, or he died months after his son was shot down and killed. Um, so it's, Roosevelt, you know, he kind of brought that on himself, but he was promoting this idea of masculinity through especially race and class. And especially in the United States, it's mostly about race. We don't really get the modern sense of whiteness until after World War II. But whiteness is starting to become a thing because of guys like Teddy Roosevelt and because of even guys like Jack London, uh, who are writing things around the time, Mark Twain too, uh, who are writing things about the, the distinct responsibility of white men essentially to police the world. Uh, Rudyard Kipling, uh, the white man's burden, this is kind of the one thing people point at all the time. Like Rudyard Kipling was uh, a correspondent with Teddy Roosevelt. They wrote to each other, they were fans of each other. Right? So all this, this, these ideas are all playing all the time, and it's leading to things like the first world war, but it's also eroding the idea that fencing is something that is kind of particular or peculiar 
or a way, a, a valuable way to express masculinity because you can do it through football now. But you can do it through other organized sports. Uh, this is a period where uh, professional baseball is really taking off. I also play vintage baseball, by the way. Um, but, but then we had the First World War, and on top of all these changing ideas and the nationalism of armies and the weaponry improving and everything, we also just literally kill whole generations of young men who, who had these ideas about the martial aristocracy, and they had these ideas about whose responsibility it is to fight war. And when you pulverize them by the hundreds of thousands, those ideas die a pretty violent death, pretty suddenly. So the First World War is the end of all these ideas, right? This is, this is more or less where it dies. It dies under machine gun fire. Um, fencing obviously still exists. People still fence today. But after 1918, it, it doesn't have the kind of aristocratic flavor that it had before. And the aristocratic flavor is what connects the idea of your masculine value to things like warfare. And that's gone by the Coast World War. So that's more or less it, right? <laughs> um, so when we talk about like bringing a sword to a gunfight, swords are still useful on battlefields. Um, and at minimum, they're useful because you have a guy out front whose job it is to lead you, who's pointing with a sword, right? And even in the Civil War, there's not a lot of battles that are decided on like a, a heroic saber charge, but we know that Custer was part of saber charge at Gettysburg. Um, we know that there are plenty of, uh, of battles among cavalry in um, the Crimean War, in the American Civil War, all through the 19th century. Um, even at the beginning of the First World War, there were plenty of people who thought bayonet charges would still work. And they did sometimes, but, but then when you're charging a group that is also in trenches behind barbed wire, behind machine guns, it starts becoming less and less effective. But then, you still want to do the bayonet charge, but you just preload everything with artillery first. Or you, you scout with the airplanes and make sure you know exactly where everything's going. So, I know we didn't talk too much about like fencing, necessarily, um, but we have like plenty of time. Because it is a two hour lecture, and it's 6.48 right now, so I know it's about an hour. So, does anybody have any questions? You know what that is? <laughs> <laughs> sword. It's, it's a pistol sword. So pistol swords, I think, are really fun. There's a lot of combination weapons that are part of culture in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. Um, anybody know what these are actually for? Shooting and stabbing. <laughs> nope. They're maybe at best for display, but what they what they're made for is this is a masterpiece. This is an apprentice. Oh. Smith or gun maker who's making this to show off how good he is at engineering and making stuff. So all of the combination weapons that you've ever seen are not meant to do anything other than show off how good the craftsman is at building this stuff. And that's what they're for. Right? So I see a lot of people saying that would never work. What a stupid idea. It wasn't nobody nobody wanted it to work. The idea was that you're gonna make a goofy toy that you're gonna show to dad and dad's gonna be like, good job. But that's it. I mean I want it. Yes, I, I, and it will work, right? Like part of part of what you do with your master test is to make sure that it actually functions. So if you're the guy who in 1587 or whatever made a revolver sword, you actually have to load those cylinders and fire it <laughs> to prove that it works, because otherwise what's the point, right? Yes? All right, lots of questions, but first, so speaking about the martial aristocracy, and the culture of fencing. What happens when you kind of flip the table on that in like the French Revolution? And like, how does fencing culture change uh, during like the Revolutionary Wars and then like into the First Empire and yeah. then like the Restoration so, and things like interesting that? Interesting enough, the French Revolution replaced dueling with um, lynching. <laughs> Uh, and I'm being a little flippant, and this is not my area of expertise, so I could be wrong, but from what I understand, um, there was another renewed interest in the duel following Napoleon's coronation. And among the Grand Army, and among the, uh, the sort of the remnants of the War of the Revolution, uh, you start getting people who are mad about duel. Uh, has anybody seen the film The Duelists? Yeah. Yeah. So it's loosely based on a real story about two kind of perennial enemies who constantly fight these duels that never end anything. It's a great movie. It's really good. 
And it's amazing to think that the guy who directed that movie also directed Napoleon, because Napoleon is terrible, and the duelist is actually quite good. Um, so in the revolutionary period, rather than settling kind of masculine scores with dueling, mostly what it is is, is you're not revolutionary enough. I see that you're wearing pants, and that we can't have, right? So <laughs> you'll get, like they had what they called revolutionary tri tribunals, which are really interesting when you look at them from the perspective of somebody who studied the 16th century mercenary period a lot, because this is very similar to the way that a lot of uh, mercenaries kind of solve interpersonal disputes within the company. But more or less what's happening is, if I think you're, you're not sufficiently revolutionary, I can accuse you of something, we'll have a tribunal, and you might be killed. Sorry, especially if you were in a position of leadership before the revolution, you're very suspicious. Yeah, I was wondering right? because I know that there was like a mass exodus of yeah. know, like the officers, um, but like those that remained, that yeah. there were like definitely specific instances of like their particular units like protecting them from stuff like that. And I wonder. Well, there's a couple. So there's a couple things. So first, a lot of the um, aristocrats who fled France ended up in places like New Orleans, and yeah. New Orleans has. Uh, has long had a very robust fencing culture. Um, and so it's, if you're in the United States and, and you're fighting a duel, it's much more likely to do with a sword if you're around New Orleans than it is almost anywhere else in the country. Um, and a lot of that is because former aristocrats of France relocated there during and after the revolution because they're trying to escape. But they're also leaving from, there's a rebellion in Barbados in um, the 1790s. And this is, again, connected to the French Fourth Revolution and various other things. Um, and they're ending up in places like New Orleans, and they're bringing their kind of aristocratic fencing culture with them. And what's happening with the Grand Army after the coronation of Napoleon is that the Grand Army is formed of all of the, the veterans of the 1790s wars. So if anybody knows about like the wars of the French Revolution, this is when France was fighting everyone else on Earth, <laughs> one at a time, and beating the shit out of them all of the time. And they're doing it with guys who don't have shoes, who are probably not fed, and are definitely not paid. And they're doing it because of revolutionary fervor. So when those guys are left around in about 1805, when Napoleon's getting ready to do the Austerlitz campaign and all this other stuff, he's forming, he creates the identity of the Grand Army as saying, you're my boys, you're the guys who beat the shit out of everyone else on Earth, and now I'm going to take you with me to Austria, and we're going to go to Poland, and we're going to go to Russia, and all this other stuff, right? And so when Napoleon basically says, you're my special boy, you guys are the veterans, you're the ones that won this war against the world, now you have some skin in the game when it comes to masculinity, and that's what leads to look like the dueling craze among Napoleon's officers, right? Because they're, they're suddenly given a purpose for it. Whereas before, you're just a peasant, and now you're a veteran of the Grand Army, and you've got something to prove, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah. I was wondering, Joe, do you see those same veterans now after? Uh, Napoleon shipped off because um, you had mentioned that uh, what West Point 1814 they start acquiring a bunch of French people. Mm. Uh, are these the French people from oh that's 1790s or are these I'm the French people from the 18 like 14 sure. 1815? That's a really good question because I know if you look up there's a Wikipedia page for it. If you look up West Point Master of the Sword, there's a list of of all of them. And you can, okay. you can go look. So the first one that they listed is 1814. Um, that was at a, West Point itself has a weird history and culture. Um, and it isn't until I believe 1819, there's a guy named Sylvanus Thayer. Sylvanus Thayer is considered the father of West Point. Um, he, he came in and reformed, basically. He, he was the first person to put in like the um, Damaris thing and re he reformed the, the curriculum and everything. He, he basically made it the engineering school. And he based that on his studies of France. He went to France uh, after the Napoleonic Wars, and he toured around uh, like engineering école, and he decided to just bring that culture wholesale back to West Point, and he was appointed in charge. And that's probably why he hired French, French guys. But that became a thing, and American military culture was infatuated with the French until the 1870s. Anybody know why the 1870s ended that? Prussian War? Yeah. Prussians, yeah. So the Franco-Prussian War, the Prussians kicked the shit out of the French. And contrary to modern memes, the French were considered the baddest people on the planet at the time. <laughs> so when the Prussians beat the French really badly, everywhere else on earth that was infatuated with the French suddenly replaced their little like you know forage caps with eagle. So, um, <laughs> I I worked for several years at Fort Mackinac 
and we interpreted the 1880s American military. And this was because Fort Mackinac at the time was the headquarters of uh, the nation's second national park. And it was only in the national park until 1895. But um, they were park rangers for the most part. And we represented that period of, uh, of Mackinac history, and we wore dress uniforms with spike helmets because Americans just we were like, forget the French, we're going we're gonna to go with those guys. Um, and they adopted a, a spike helmet they, they uh, wore for about 20 years before they, again, kind of reformed the uniforms. Um, but yeah, so the, the Franco Prussian War kind of ended the infatuation with the French, but up until that point, up until 1882, I think only two other people um, were not, did not have very French names, at least then. They might not have actually been French, but they, had, they certainly had French names. And the only other guy before 1882, was a guy named Henry Wayne, who ended up becoming a traitor, so fuck that guy. Um, but he actually, Henry Wayne wrote a book, he wrote a saber treatise, and uh, he was the master of, he was the master of the sword, I think, for like three or four years in the 1840s. Um, but his influence on fencing, I doubt, lasted much longer than his tenure, because he was a traitor, so <laughs> we don't care anymore. <laughs> so. Yes? Uh, is it being an American's loving First Nation combat weapons, are there any accounts of American duels fought with First Nation weapons, and if so, did certain social classes flock to it and avoid it? I think that probably the thing I would point to is, is knives. Fuck knives, skinny knives, that kind of thing. Um, American knife fighting was it was its own particular thing. Obviously, like we talked about Jim Bowie and, and the Bowie knife and everything. And that comes from a culture of knife fighting. And I think the culture of knife fighting itself is partly due to kind of infatuation with sort of indigenous weaponry and fighting tactics and things like that, but there were really no, there was no dueling culture among American Indians, as, as far as I can see. Um, they had constant small-scale warfare, and they were not above murdering people, which they did all the time, and these are mostly people who were like declared enemies, right? I'm not saying Americans really loved the idea that Indians were savage and whatnot, and it was their rejection of savagery. This is way more than any of you need, <laughs> trust me. But uh, a lot of a lot of ideas of uh, like American racism was not necessarily born out of the idea that, that indigenous men necessarily are like a different race. It's that they are savages, and a savage is somebody who behaves like a savage. It's not a person who has any inborn qualities, or whatever. And when you look at like uh, church schools and the kind of like colonial like prayer towns and things, they're trying to, what they're trying to do is bring American Indians into discipline. They're trying to get them to understand that our way is the way that it should be, and that you're just lagging behind a few centuries because of, you know, linear evolution. Um, so, when, so, Americans don't want to go fight wars like the indigenous. They want to fight wars using the best indigenous ideas within this disciplined kind of core of kind of European thing. So, I, I don't know of any duels that were fought with like war clubs or anything like that, but I know of plenty of knife fights. Um, and I think that's probably the closest hit that, that you can get. Yeah. So, as far as uh, like westward expansion, especially, because I learned in Pennsylvania, area, saturated with Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. East Coast, Maryland, yeah. and then I moved to Alabama where there was no yeah. And so I got to take that with me and build a career. Mm -hmm. As the East Coast you know, moves west, did anyone try to take this to the heartland, or did they all just skip straight to California? I think for the most part they go to California, but only because that's where people live, <laughs> right? And so like, um, when you look at like the career of Thomas Monstry, um, as soon as he ends up in, the first thing he does when he arrives in America, after he was blown up in a boat, was he goes up to like a recruiting office in like Washington DC and says, I'm a master fencer, hire me to train the armies how to fence. And they mostly laughed at him because they, that's not how the American army works. They're like, you can go join a volunteer regiment there's plenty of those forming up, and Monster was like, I'm beneath that. I'm going to go be a sailor. <laughs> um, but uh, as soon as he leaves, that, as soon as he recovers from his, his wound, uh, it's probably a hernia, called a uh, burst belly or something like that. Um, he settles in Baltimore, and he starts a fencing school immediately. But he goes around the country, but it's mostly between the East Coast and California, and he's never really anywhere else, as far as I know. Um, I think, for the most part, just the, the demographics of who's moving west and for the reasons that they are sort of preclude the idea that there's really going to be much of a big fencing culture. Although I, I'm not going to say that like, there were no fencing schools 
culture in places like that. But you know, your Western boomtown lasts 10, 15 years, and then everybody leaves because you know there's no gold anymore. And you you get a lot more utility out of your knife or revolver than you would from fencing. So, but I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to I'd have to look like specifically for examples of that. I'm sure there is some out there. I just haven't come across it. Next, sir. So I don't know if I know like the makeup of 17th century armies as far as how many men were cavalry versus infantry, but uh, how prevalent of an effect was uh, like cavalry units used in the 17th century as far as keeping the tradition of like fencing alive and like what was the logistics of training those people? Like they obviously didn't, maybe they didn't come from the aristocracy of mass. I don't see that being the case, but how did that look as far as like, in the 17th century? It's much more likely that if you have a horse, it's your horse. Um, so most of the people that would be in cavalry regiments, or cavalry groups, whatever you want to call them at the time, probably came from uh, an aristocratic household, if not being aristocrats themselves. Um, so these are people generally, like, again, you're going and hiring mercenary armies because they already exist, right? You, uh, I know that you can hire 500 guys right now, and you're gonna go round up the people that you know that have horses and armor and swords and everything, and these are probably people who are, if not aristocrats themselves, they are attached to the social silo of aristocracy, if that makes sense. Um, because the 17th century predates any kind of formal large-scale training by about 100 years at least. Um, nobody was doing this. It, it's a complete waste of time to train anyone. Training is something that you do individually, so there are plenty of people who probably just fencing when they have a spare time, uh, and you train for, like, special novelty things, right? Like you need to cross this particular ditch outside this particular fort. So you're gonna get a bunch of guys and you're gonna drill with the ladders and so you can go across the ditch and you can go do a thing, right? Um, that's really what training is. It's not th this idea of kind of formal, um, it's again, it's something I see on the internet all the time, like the idea that once you hit the 18th century, fencing treatises aren't about fencing anymore, they're about drilling, right? You drill this thing. And some of them are, but it's really hard to distinguish from the ones that are actually about fencing, where, where like the, the position of like West Point, again, is that they're teaching people how to fence because it's something that's valuable to an officer to know how to do, because again, mental elasticity, the ability to deal with novelty, um, keeping fit, keeping active, that kind of thing. Uh, but this is, it's not, it's not, you're not just drilling, you know, cut one, cut two, cut three, you're doing some of that, but you're doing that to a point where you get familiar enough that you can just go fence, and then you, that's how you train, right? Um, so it's similar in about the 17th century, but they're just, they're just not doing the drill part at all. It's just, you learn how to fence or you don't. Um, by the 19th century, a lot of what the, in the Civil War or the Crimean War, a lot of what cavalry regiments are actually doing is they're not actually doing heroic charges on the battlefield or everything. They're working as um, provosts. You know what that means? So provost is the guy who rides behind the formation that's going forward, and they're the people who beat people who are trying to run away with the flat of their sword and tell them to turn around and go back. Um, so they're they're doing basically camp policing stuff more than more than probably anything else. They're also doing scouting and all sorts of that that type of thing. But largely, especially early on in the American Civil War, cavalry regiments were more or less devoted to making sure people don't shirk. That's the term that they have, um, and it's kind of hard to spot because shirking. It's also really interesting, right? Because you, let's say you're a, you're a, you're a corn-fed boy from the Midwest, seeing the elephant for the first time, right? And you decide, this is terrible, I don't wanna be here. Um, rather than just like falling out of line and running away, you just find the nearest wounded guy and then you and 12 other guys grab him and drag him back into the field hospital because you're doing something useful, right? Yeah. So that kind of thing happened a lot. And that's what like promo stars were supposed to watch out for, was like, you, we don't need 14 people to carry this one wounded guy. <laughs> 12 of you go back, right? <laughs> Three supervisors, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. right, yeah. Um, so does, does that answer your question? Because I know like, yeah. in the 17th century, these things are, are totally different than they are in the 19th. Um, and things have changed quite a lot. And in terms of like, who is part of an army and how those guys are in the army has radically changed. Um, but in the 17th century, anybody on a horse probably owns that horse. Or, or at least owned a horse before that one died. And then now they have a replacement. Right. Yeah. Um, you made a reference to um, this shift in mentality of like who's responsible for fighting horse from like the aristocracy to like everyone. Uh, like what happens in your opinion? Like what, what, was, what was responsible for that sort of uh, conscription? 
Okay. It's conscription. So the First World War is um, a lot of the pressures that the First World War put on the state was mostly just in terms of like you need to pay these guys. Okay. Every single person that can be in a uniform has to be in a uniform, and we have to pay them, we have to do this. Um, so the shift is not necessarily that like you know, working class people feel the need to go and, and serve the country. Right. That's part of the propaganda, and of course plenty of people probably felt that way. But what's happening is mostly that like you know, Britain needs literally every single person they possibly can get in uniform, so they're putting them all in uniform and sending them over. Gotcha. And this creates a sense where like if you're not in uniform, then you're working in the factories to rifles and shells and all that. Um, and this is this is also why like by World War II it's considered okay to just like mass murder people in German cities because they're still providing things for the war effort even if they're not uniformed soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, so like these ideas are essentially connecting like conscription and sort of this the sense that you belong to the state and the state can do with you what they please. Like that's the change. It's it's gotcha. a it's a, it's a thing about the mechanisms of state power rather than it is about like individual people changing their ideas, right? But once once you pass that, once you pass the line that says it's okay to mass murder civilians by the tens of thousands, like that is fundamentally changed the face of warfare forever, right? And when when you look at like the way people talk about warfare in the 19th century or even like the American Civil War, which again massive bloody conflict, lots and lots of people are dying. The way that that, that guys like Hitchcock, right? He's a volunteer soldier. He's not somebody who's professional, but he wants to end the rebellion. He doesn't he doesn't think necessarily that it's like his first role to be conscripted to do it. He wants to go do it and his, his job is to destroy the rebellion. It's not necessarily to kill rebels. Um, and now in modern military they, that's the whole purpose of the military is kill. That's it. That's that's its sole purpose. And if you explain that to somebody in the nineteenth century they think that's barbaric and bloodthirsty. Uh, it's just not the way <clears throat> it's just not the way they thought about warfare. You have a question? I had a thought, like the need for states to pay for conscripted soldiers, is that what led to the rise of the income tax? I don't know. That's a good question. Thoughts connected yeah. to that line. It could be. There's yeah. a pretty large like, change in the, the French and English cultures around the, I think around the end of the 100 years of war, where they start being able to pay for armies. And when they proceed to be able to pay for armies, and then, you know, that things happen. And then yeah. they tax right. people. Right, right. Yeah. 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 But like the creation of bureaucracy to make taxes work yeah. is a big part of the why the flex start winning. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah so and like expansion of like the administrative class and the and bureaucracy and everything, all of this is actually about the pressures of like paying soldiers. Because prior to the moon landing, it's the most expensive thing anyone can do. Hmm. Like even like building cathedrals is cheaper in the long run than it is paying armies. Wow. Paying armies is something that you absolutely do not want to do. Uh, you mentioned that um, in the age of guns, um, the swords were largely a feature of the officer of this area class, and they would use these for doing them. They would bring them on the battlefield. Yeah. What was the source of these swords, and what were they any good? It was kind of broad, my question. So, by about the 1780s, um, at least the British are starting to manufacture patterns of swords. As they call them. So they have like the you know light suit, light cavalry saber, or whatever. But they're getting mass produced. Um, if you've read the Sharp novels, yeah. uh, Bernard Carmel must have come across some description somewhere of like the, the 1797 cavalry pattern sword was unpopular or something. And he made that like a whole thing in the series where like Sharp specifically carries a bigger, heavier one because he thinks it's like way better and cooler. Um, there's a lot of like in Britain and the United States. I don't know. I don't know about France necessarily. But these were mostly contracts where it's like, we need 100,000 swords right now. So you have people that go out and they call everybody they know who can make, you know, they call people make razors, they call people make spoons, whatever they say, you're making swords now, and they give them a contract. So you might have a company that has made blades before and you know what you're doing and you make really good swords, but you might make the exact same pattern of sword really shitty. And there's no way for us to tell until we get them in people's hands and they start breaking or not, right? There's actually a lot of uh, stories about Cavalry sabers in the American Civil War that were recovered having never been sharpened because they came out of the factory with you know like if you buy like a, a Kingston Arms sharp or something today right it has the factory edge which is terrible uh, and you have to go grind your own edge into it and this is just something that that cavalry regiments didn't think was all that important because even even at the height of sort of like 
kind of big cavalry actions in 1863, four and whatever, you're still not fighting with swords all that much. Um, there's uh, anybody heard of Ben Grierson? Ben is a really interesting guy if you're looking for uh, like Civil War officers to kind of read up on. Um, Grierson was the commander of a really ambitious, deep, uh, penetrative raid in 1863 leading up to the Battle of Vicksburg. Um, he describes using his sword one time. And this, this was a, a raid that lasts like six weeks. Uh, this is something where his job is to go and just massively disrupt anything that he possibly can uh, in sort of the backwoods of uh, the rebel holdings to distract the rebels from the fact that the Americans were coming to Vicksburg. So they were just going and making a mess behind the lines uh, every time. They were, they would like get up to like, uh, like you know, a bridge guard or whatever. They just pretend to be rebels and just like pass themselves off that way. And it's a, it's a really interesting sort of a thing, right? It's an interesting little microcosm of the war. He talks about using a sword one time. And he talks about using a sword one time, and you'll enjoy this, because he found his men had stolen a chicken. <laughs> and, uh, and he went and, and said, well, that's not allowed. So he beat the guy with his, the flat of his sword and took the chicken, and they ate the chicken. <laughs> and this is literally the only time he talks, he ever uses the word sword at all. Um, and it's, it's just, it's that, right? It's just this kind of like, again, soldiers never change. War changes all the time. Soldiers themselves are always hungry, always underpaid. <laughs> They always...